Welcome to New World Church this Sabbath morning. My name is Carlos, uh, Carlos Pedrera. I am going to be your elder on duty for this service this morning. I'm also going to be the worship leader. Therefore, if you need me, you can find me right at the end. And if I can assist you with anything, praying for you or with you, please don't hesitate to approach me. Uh, meet on Tuesday evenings and they're called Meadow Quilters. Tomorrow they're holding their biennial exhibition in this room starting at 11 and running through until 4 o'clock. And you're very welcome to come and see the work that they have been doing over the last two years. Um, for those of you who are not so interested in thread and stitches, there will also be homemade cakes for sale. If you want to know more about it, there is a poster in the foyer on the notice board and I'm sure they'd be very pleased for you to come along and enjoy the beautiful things that they've made. Thank you. A David song. Thank you. Everything in me says thank you. Angels listen and I sing my thanks. I kneel in worship facing your holy temple and say it again, thank you. Thank you for your love, thank you for your faithfulness. Most holy is your name, most holy is your word. The moment I called out, you stepped in. You made my life large with your strength.
Let us pray. Our Lord, our awesome God, indeed we thank you for who you are, for the love that you show us, for the kindness, the mercy and the grace. Because before we even know you, you knew us. And since then, Lord, since we were created, you have poured the entire heaven onto this earth for our salvation. You humbled yourself to come to live among us and to be one of us and to be killed by us. And Lord, when we contemplate what you've done for us, we cannot comprehend the depth of your love. But we are here as testimony, Lord, that we want to. But this thank you for inviting us into your house. We ask all this in the holy name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and he put me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. The Lord led me around among the bones. There were many bones at the bottom of the valley. I saw the bones were very dry. Then he asked me, Human being, can these bones live? I answered, Lord, God, only you know. The Lord said to me, Prophesy to these bones. Say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says to the bones. I will cause breath to enter you. Then you will live. I will put muscle on you. I will put flesh on you. I will cover you with skin. Then I will put breath in you and you will live. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. While I prophesied, there was a noise and a rattling. The bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and saw muscles come on the bones. Flesh grew and skin covered the bones, but there was no breath in them. Then the Lord said to me, prophesy to the wind. Prophesy, human being, and say to the wind, this is what the Lord God says. Wind, come from the four winds, breathe on these people who are killed so they can live again. So I prophesied as the Lord commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life. They stood on their feet. They were a very large army. Then the Lord said to me, Human being, these bones are like all the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are destroyed. So prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord God says. My people, I will open your graves and I will cause you to come up out of your graves. Then I will bring you into the land of Israel. This is how you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. I will open your graves and cause you to come up from them, and I will put my spirit inside you. You will come to life. Then I will put you in your own land, and you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, says the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his words. The title of today's sermon is From Despair to Hope. Uh, however, this presentation uh, was intended to be an introduction to the phenomenon of biblical prophecy as well. So, one third of this presentation will, will be spent on that to explain the phenomenon of uh, biblical prophecy, if that possible, in 10 12 minutes. And after that, we are going to look at the very text uh, we have just read. Okay, as in a good research is always, you have to have research questions. Without research questions, you can't start and you can't finish definitely. So, at the beginning of this uh, presentation, we are going to ask these three questions. What is prophecy? Who were the prophets? And I'm going to give you an example of a prophecy. What is prophecy? Uh, it is definitely a message that comes from God. But prophecy is much more than a message. Prophecy uh, is an event. Uh, prophecy is something that you not just remember and understand, but something that you accept and apply to your life. But definitely the source of every prophecy in the Bible comes from God as Peter would say in 2 Peter 1.21. What is prophecy? It was usually communicated in a supernatural way. Um, if you read the books of Isaiah, if you read the book of uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, you'll find out that they had some visions and dreams through which God discovered, revealed something to them. 
However, in the Bible you will find some prophets like Nahum, they would say, thus says the Lord, and everything goes there. However, we assume and accept that the prophets had a supernatural way of uh, revealing uh, the message from God. Uh, okay, the content of biblical prophecy was not only concerned uh, with the future of the immediate audience who listened to this prophecy, but also with their present situation and sometimes with their past as well. So, uh, there is a popular uh, opinion that prophecy is only or exclusively uh, connected with somebody's future. <coughs> but when you read the Bible, prophecy is not always and only about future. Very often it's about the present situation of the people of Israel and very much the prophets, they would like to make a parallel, they would like to give a lesson to their audience, bringing them back to their past. So we can say that prophecy actually has a dimension of prediction. And in the literature you'll find these, uh, these expressions, foretelling. And this dimension of every prophecy is about predicting the future. Another term is proclamation. So prophecy is both prediction and proclamation. So prophecy is not only about to predict the future, but to prepare the audience for that future. And very often the prophets, in, the, in terms of statistic and content, less predicted and more proclaimed. Probably they would communicate the prediction in a couple of sentences, but at the same time, they would spend much more time and much more efforts to help people to understand that prediction and to prepare for the future events. So, these two elements of every single prophecy in the Bible are very, very important. Prediction and proclamation. To tell people what is their present situation, what is your future, but at the same time, how to prepare yourself for that future. Uh, there are two types of prophecies. Uh, there is a so-called classical prophecy, and I put on the screen some of the names of people uh, who uh, have been classified as classical prophets. Elijah, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, to a certain extent. Uh, so, they are called classical prophecy because uh, there are typical elements of classical prophecy. Uh, the classical prophecy and the content of their, of their message was concerned with the immediate future of their audience. Uh, at the same time, these prophecies were more of local, uh, of local implication than universal implication. Uh, classical prophecies were either directed towards the people of Israel or to the real figures of the foreign nations among, uh, around them. And usually in classical prophecy the interest was the immediate future of people of Israel or the immediate future of the foreign nations, usually foreign nations bordering Israel, occupying Israel or threatening Israel. And it was about their imminent, uh, about their imminent or immediate uh, future. Usually in classical prophecies, the symbolism used is very simple. And if there is a prophecy for a far future, usually that kind of prophesying is kind of a leap from a present situation of the prophet directly to the glorious future. Also in classical prophecy, you may find that idea of gradual restoration. Gradual restoration. It's not radical break of the reality, an immediate change of the situation, but it's a gradual change of reality. Symbolism, as I said, is very simple, and quite, it, it, it is a quite usual situation that this symbolism is immediately explained within the text why is it, it is mentioned. On the other hand, you've got so-called apocalyptic prophecy. Uh, Usually in the Old Testament, when we talk about apocalyptic, we mention Daniel. However, 
there are some apocalyptic elements in the book of Isaiah, like Isaiah 24 to 27. Definitely there are some apocalyptic uh, elements in the book of Ezekiel, especially in the later chapters, and also in some other prophets in the uh, Old Testament. Apocalyptic prophecy is more complex than the classical prophecy, especially in terms of symbolism. So the symbolism is very complex. Sometimes it is explained in the text, sometimes it is not. The book of Daniel is blessed with a hermeneutical key that when you read about visions and dreams, immediately you have a person of authority in the text who explains what the vision or dreams means. In apocalyptic prophecy, uh, the complex order is very, uh, the, the symbolism is also very complex. At the same time, apocalyptic prophecy, to a great extent, leans or relies on classical prophecy. So basically, in apocalyptic prophecy, you will find many elements uh, and many symbols from the classical prophecy and from the other parts of the Bible as well. Apocalyptic prophecy, the stress of the apocalyptic prophecy uh, is on the future and especially on the last days. Eschatology is very much part of the apocalyptic. So in apocalyptic prophecies, the prophet uh, is very much, and God is very much interested into uh, later days. At the same time, in apocalyptic prophecy, it is very important that there is a conflict. Of course, there is a conflict in classical prophecy as well. But in the apocalyptic prophecy, the conflict is universal. It's not only local. For example, in the book of Daniel, Daniel 1, you've got a local conflict between the king, the king of Judah, King Jehoiakim, and the king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And this is a local conflict. But how you proceed towards the end of the book, you'll find that there will be a universal conflict which is described in Daniel 10 to 12. So there is a movement from local to universal. And that's how the symbols, the events in the apocalyptic should be understood from local to universal. And usually these events, different to classical prophecy, they are not just a jump from or leap from this present situation into future, but they are rather a continual description of chain of events. So chain of events. For example, in Daniel 2, uh, you have a foreign uh, royal figure who had a dream, and Daniel told him the content of the dream and the interpretation of the dream, the historical application of the dream. And dream actually uh, expresses an idea of development of human history from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the coming of kingdom of God. So basically this chain of events is a continuum. This chain of events is not a leap, it's just a continuation. Also another difference from classical prophecy is the radical break of reality. In classical prophecy you've got the idea of gradual restoration of Israel. They are now exiles, they are now in bad situation, However, God will, God will produce certain events, certain circumstances, if they respond to his message, and he will gradually change the situation. In apocalyptic prophecy, that change is radical. That change is a break of the historical events as we know them today, and some a radically new reality will take place. For example, you've got that statue in Daniel 2, and suddenly a stone or rock hits the feet of the statue, and the statue disappears. And this rock actually fulfills the earth and does the symbol of the kingdom of God. So it's a radical break of uh, reality. But for both of these types of prophecy, there are also common things. They both come from God, and they both end on a very positive note. So people of God who listen to this, people of God who read this, they can find some hope. They can find some way out of this depressing 
a very pessimistic reality. Especially in the apocalyptic prophecy, the present situation of humanity is described in a very pessimistic terms. However, the prophecy, the apocalyptic prophecy would say that this pessimistic reality would be radically changed in the future. Whatever, classical or apocalyptic, they both come from God and special for the people of God. What is prophecy? At last, that's what understanding of certain situation communicated by a particularly chosen human being. Uh, this is a definition uh, I've taken from Abraham Heschel. Abraham Heschel was one of the most renowned rabbis of the 20th century, and he wrote a seminal book called The Prophets. And he would say that the prophets in its essence is God's view, God's understanding of certain situation. And that understanding is communicated through a particularly chosen human being. So basically, prophecy is God's perspective of certain situation, or certain individuals, or certain community. And this is very important. Abraham Heschel would go further and he would say, prophecy is actually God's exegesis of reality. But not reality in general terms, like in Hellenistic philosophy, but of a very specific event, very specific part of reality. And this is very important when you read the prophecies. Uh, the difference between the prophecies and, for example, the Hellenistic uh, consideration of thinking or speculation about the reality is this. Hellenistic philosophers, they usually try to distance themselves from the reality and try to look at the reality from a so-called objective stance. However, the prophets, they do not distance from the reality. They are part of reality, but they receive a message from God who can see in the best possible way the reality as it is. And God gives this understanding. I'm intentionally refuse to use God's explanation because explanation mostly appeals to our cognitive part of our, uh, of our personality. Understanding, especially from the biblical point of view, is much more than our ratio and our cognitive dimension of, of our lives. Understanding is something that is holistic, that appeals to our minds, appeals to our mental, appeals to our emotional, appeals to our spiritual and physical as well. Also understanding, understanding requests an action, a reaction to God's prophecy, a reaction to his understanding of prophecy. God expects from people who listen to a prophecy, not just to understand that prophecy, but to apply that prophecy to adhere to that prophecy, to accept that prophecy, and to live by that prophecy. Okay. We can't talk about prophets, uh, about prophecy, without mentioning the prophets themselves. Uh, in terms of biblical prophecy, you can't, you can't separate the prophet himself or herself from their message, from their prophecy. They are one phenomenon, and that's why it is very important to understand who were the prophets. The first thing we should take out of our minds is that the prophets were not God's microphones. It means that they included their personality, their expertise, their experience, their personal life, even their family life, in their prophetic office. So they were not just people who were detached from the reality, from the events. They were not just kind of a robots talking something that they did not understand properly. But very often, in majority of the situation, the prophets were very much concerned with the content of the prophecy. And their personality and private life was also part of their prophetic office and message. 
Look at Jeremiah. Look at him. Probably around the, one of the best books in the Old Testament, prophetic books, if you would like to get into the inner life of the prophet, is the book of Jeremiah. And how he experienced that prophetic office from inside. Look at the life of Ezekiel, his family life. In Ezekiel 24, God says to him, Your wife, tomorrow your wife will die. And you're not going to cry after her. And you're not going to do the things usually done by people who are in mourning. And the prophet says, by that evening, his wife died. And he didn't cry. He didn't change his clothes or his appearance in accordance to the cultural convention of the times. Why? Because God said to him, this is the message for your community. As you are not crying now for your wife, I am not going to cry for the sons of these exiled people in Jerusalem who are going to be killed by the Babylonian king. So basically, the personal tragedy of Ezekiel became a prophetic message. Prophet Isaiah also mentions his family, his children, as part of their prophetic ministry. This is very important. Being a Christian, or even better, being a part of the prophetic people, as we do believe that we are prophetic movement. It's not only about us. It's not only about the message we proclaim. It's about everything we have. It's about our life, it's about our family, it's about our relations, it's about everything. So we are totally into it. Who were the prophets? The prophets were not politically correct, measured by the standards of their time. Today, they would have even worse experience. They were not politically correct, definitely. How can it be politically correct to come out in front of the king and to tell him something about his secret sexual life? And not just about that, but to tell him in front of his courtiers that he is a murderer. Actually, to cause the king himself to say about, to tell about himself that he is a murderer who deserves to be killed. That was not politically correct. They were often labeled by their opponents as anti-patriotic. Jeremiah, he was told because of his prophetic message that he was anti-patriotic. They were disturbing people because they disturbed nation and individuals with their, with their prophetic ministry. Elijah was called a troublemaker. Troublemaker. Somebody who caused unfortunate events in Israel. Some of them were called delusional. Why? Because their motto was not, it's not, it's none of my business. Everything was their business. Jeremiah would come in front of the gates in the temple, at the temple, and he would say, This temple will disappear. There is a judgment upon you because there is a religious hypocrisy. You rely on this temple, but at the same time, you do injustice to widows, orphans, and foreigners. So basically, even the so-called trivial things were very important to the prophets. Widows, orphans, foreigners, discriminated people, people who experienced uh, injustice. Isaiah would say that God will judge his people because of their disobedience. Because of their bad way of doing business. Because of double measures because of making all sorts of problems. 
On the contrary, many things were done were their business. They actually deconstructing human hypocrisy, injustice, discrimination, and very importantly, wrong theological convictions. I know that we need in time when people would say, okay, we don't need theory, we need some proper practice. But let me tell you, with wrong theological convictions, especially about God's character, we are going to end up in a very wrong practice. Wrong theological convictions. They believed in the time of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7, this is the temple of the Lord. And because the temple is here, nothing bad would happen to us, regardless what kind of life we have, regardless of our behavior, regardless of our beliefs, regardless that we discriminate some, somebody, regardless of us doing injustice, regardless of our hypocrisy, because the temple is here, nothing bad would happen to us. And that was wrong theology, because that temple disappeared. And they disappeared, some of them. So basically, they were deconstructing people's wrong concepts about God. Who were the prophets? People of suffering. People misunderstood by their contemporaries. Very often lonely figures. Jeremiah was explicitly told by God, you're not going to marry it. You're not going to get married. Well, today, it's not a problem. There are singles, no problem. Would you like to get married? No problem. Would you like to be single? That's fine. That's normal. But at that time, within Israel, who understood that the first commandment was multiply and fill the earth, in Israel, in which culture, having plenty of children, was imperative, this gentleman, in 6th, 7th century BC, he was told, you're not going to get married. You're going to remain alone your whole life. Because this measure, this phenomenon, will show to your people my message. Very much they were misunderstood. Sometimes they were even filled with doubt. Again, Jeremiah, Jeremiah 20. 7 to 14. Even if you go further to 18, you have this attitude of Jeremiah who is full of doubts. But at the same time, doubts, he expressed them in a dialogue with God. Always in a dialogue with God. And he remained faithful to him in 40 years of service. Still, the prophets were people who, after deconstructing, people's wrong understanding and an unacceptable behavior had an incredible ability to bring hope to the hopeless situations and often consolation in dire circumstances. That's very important. And there is almost a pattern in every prophetic book. Usually the books of the prophets would start with deconstruction. <laughs> Isaiah 1, he would say, the ox or the donkey knows its master and the ox knows the place, the place or the manger where it eats. However, my people do not know me. This is a deconstruction, basically saying to them, you are worse than the ox and the donkey. Jeremiah also deconstructing at the beginning. Ezekiel deconstructing heavily wrong conceptions. But also how you proceed to read the book further, you'll find that these people offered hope, a way out from this bad pessimistic situation. So basically the prophets were people who would insult other people, who would offend other people, who would disturb other people, but at the same time, they would tell them, it's not an insult, it's not an offense, because you understand like that, but it's a deconstruction, and that deconstruction is very painful. Why it's very painful? Some psychiatrists would say that we human beings, we tend 
to be safe. And we always stand or we always look after security. And some of them would say, and use this metaphor, that people would rather be anchored in delusional ideas, in something that is wrong, than to sail on the rough sea seeking for the truth. So basically the prophets would say to people, just cut off from the wrong anchors, cut off from your delusions and wrong ways. There is a false security there. And follow God. Because even if you can't see where you go, you can see God who is leading you. So basically their message was not about where you go, but who is leading you. And that's faith. Like Abraham, it says in Hebrews 11, he went out not knowing where he was going. Why? Because he believed God. Okay. Let me give you an example of a prophecy in Ezekiel 37, 1-14. This is one of the most treated prophecies of Ezekiel, probably chapter 1 as well. But this one is very, is very well known. The first uh, okay, let me tell you a few, wo few words about Ezekiel. He was a prophet, active during the exile, which means somewhere in 6th century, probably for 22, 23 years. He came from a priestly family. He was born and grew up, uh, grew up in the land of Judah, and probably in Jerusalem, and he was taken exile, probably when he was 25. Because of the content of his visions, dreams, because of his behavior, how he passed the message, very often because of his unusual, unconventional way, he was concerned and he was considered as an eccentric prophet. However, he was an unusual prophet, working in very unusual circumstances, so God worked through him in a very unusual way. The exile was a period of testing ideas about God. Was his presence limited to the land of Israel? How did God demonstrate his power in the land of other gods? And was there any hope for the exiles? These are the questions answered by this prophecy. And let me go closer to this prophecy. In verses 1 and 2, you're going to get this kind of introduction or orientation in the prophecy. It is said that the hand of the Lord came upon him, and the hand of the Lord, or the Spirit of the Lord, brought him out. So basically the expressions, the hand of the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord, in this parallelism, are the same. And he was brought down, or settled down, in a valley, it says my translation, in Revised Standard Version, but it's a kind of a very, very wide valley. It's like a plain. And what is very surprising for him, in verse 2, he would say, Behold! Some contemporary English translations would uh, take out this behold. But very often this particle behold is mentioned here. And obviously in verse 2 it's not just a rhetorical device for us to look more uh, closely to the prophecy, but behold is an expression of the prophet's surprise. Because in this valley he can see what? That the valley was full of bones. And he said that the Spirit of the Lord led him all around them. It is a very interesting choice of prepositions in the original language. It's not just among them, but there is a preposition that would say upon them, which brings you at least in two dimensions or multi dimensional picture, which means that the prophet took a very good look at these bones. And what did he see? 
he saw that there were very many laying in the valley. It is interesting that in the original language, an adjective, very, and, uh, sorry, adverb, very, an adjective, many, is used in this combination. So basically the point is that the number of the bones was exceedingly numerous. Exceedingly numerous. If you read the prophecy further, you'll find that these bones were human bones. And now, they were exceedingly numerous, and at the same time, the same construction in the language is used that they were exceedingly dry. So basically, their quantity matched their quality. Very dry. Human bones. And he is a priest. Ezekiel was a priest. And this valley is unclean. And these bones are remains, uh, remnants uh, or remains of human bodies. They were not properly buried, uh, buried down. So the valley is a picture of horror, picture of uncleanness, picture of low dignity, of indignity, of humiliation. It's catastrophe. And now comes God's question. Son of man, can these bones live again? Can these bones live again? And remember, Ezekiel is very compliant, uh, very compliant prophet. Uh, he's never like Jeremiah to rebel or to ask certain questions. He says, you know, Lord. And God said to him, please prophesy to these bones and tell them that they are going to get into life in a very specific way in a life. These bones would come together, some sinew which will be put on them, then flesh, and at the end will be put a skin. This process of God's prophecy, this content of God's prophecy, this structure, these steps, are actually completely opposite of the steps of decomposition. <coughs> decomposition. So basically, what is opposite of decomposition? Recomposition. New creation. And after that, he said, prophesy to these bones. All dry bones hear the word of the Lord. And there is a full content of that. And the prophet says, so I prophesied as I had been commandment. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise. The bones came together. All the steps were commanded. And instead of dry bones, instead of exceedingly dry bones, now in front of him appeared human bodies. And the second phase is the Son of Man prophesied to the Spirit. Prophesied to the Spirit. The word, the word Spirit is mentioned at least ten times here and is one of the key terms. Prophecy to the Spirit. And the Spirit breathed a breed of wine into these bodies and they became alive. And the text saying in, the, in verse 10 that these was vast multitude. So, there is a contrast, there is a opposition. Vast multitude of exceedingly dry bones after the prophecy, after the activity of the prophets became a vast multitude of living people. What was the difference? Or better said, who was the difference? God the Creator. And these creational steps are very similar to Genesis 2, 7. First phase, God molded the first human being from the soil, from the Adama, from the ground. But the first human being was not alive until he put a bread of life, bread of life into his nostrils. And suddenly, it becomes a living human being. It's absolutely the same process here. So basically the message from the first 10 verses is the same God 
who once created the world and the first human beings is the same God who here in Babylon can recreate the dry bones. He is able and he is willing to do that. Very important. Because with John Paul Sartre, in his dilemmas about God's existence, well, he didn't have dilemmas, but in his discussion about God, he said God does not exist. Why? Well, look at the reality, he would say. Many innocent people just struggle. And God is either good, but he is not omnipotent, because he can't stop the suffering of the innocent. Second combination. Maybe God is omnipotent, but he is evil. He can, but he doesn't want to stop the suffering of the innocent. And finally, the third option, he says, is that God is good and God is omnipotent. It's impossible because you can't see that in reality. However, when you read this prophecy, it's completely different because this prophecy was a direct answer on the despair or to the despair of people of Israel. Because in verse 11, they said, and there was a common conventional saying among them in Babylon. We are dry bones. We are dead. There is no hope for us. And God says there is a hope. And the hope is a new creation, a restoration, a resurrection. And the prophecy ends up with a signature, with a signature statement. When I will do this, when I will act like this, they shall know that I am the Lord. So basically, the restoration of Israel, the fulfillment of this prophecy, at that time was a evidence, was a confirmation that God of Israel is not just God on the territory of Israel, but He was God everywhere at any time. And finally, he was God who was able and who is willing. It is very important to know the God, to know God, to know the Lord. And I'll finish there. To know God in the Bible is not just to know some doctrines about him, some facts or some concepts. To know God in the Bible means to have an experience with him. It means that God you read about in the Bible becomes God of your reality. And that's how the faith was born in my life and probably in your life as well. I have a friend. He lives in Belgrade. He's around mid-50s. He's been an artist all his life. He started to come to our church meetings and presentations for visitors. And he came as an agnostic atheist and he told me, uh, I don't believe in God, but I like you. I like you as a community and I would like to mingle with you. But after some time, he gave me a call and he called me, can we go for a drink? And we went for a drink and he told me, something happened in my life. God has answered my prayers and this God is God who is alive. So it's not God from your presentations, it's not God from the book, from the Bible. Now this is a God of my reality, of my experience. And that was and supposed to be the experience of Israel at that time. When your life is restored, when your life is changed, this is a confirmation that God is still alive. My brothers and sisters, do you feel like dry bone? Do you feel that you need a restoration? Do you feel at sometimes hopeless? If you do, you are in a good company because some theologians would say this is the text Jesus referred to when he spoke to Nicodemus in John 3. That's how a person who is even old can be reborn again because God is a creator, he is able and he is willing to recreate our miserable lives. May God help us to travel 
joyfully from despair to the hope. Amen. 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 Like that incredible God, always caring and always wanting to be with us, how we cannot surrender all. And so we're going to sing the hymn, 309, I Surrender All. And while we are having the hymn, we are going to pass the tithe in our prayer. So I invite you to stand to sing the hymn, I Surrender All.